A few months ago, I was able to spend some time with my parents at their home in Philadelphia, and I brought my two boys with me. My oldest is David, and he's five years old, and my youngest is Joel, who's two years old. And one evening, I was putting Joel to bed, and when I put him in his crib, he started crying and fussing. And when my dad heard that, he immediately uh, came into the room and started soothing Joel down and uh, basically put him to bed. And when my dad came out of the room, I talked to him and I said, oh, dad, you should just leave Joel because he actually can soothe himself. And I know you get tired by being with him. So, uh, you know, just let him be and he's going to be fine. And my dad said, I really don't like it when kids cry because it reminds me of the time when I used to cry all the time as a little kid. And when my dad said that, I was taken aback because it reminded me of the suffering that my dad encountered as a little kid. Uh, his dad was a reporter and in the beginning of the Korean War, the first people they were targeting were media personnel. So my grandfather was killed when my dad was very young. And a few years after that, my dad's mother passed away from sickness. And so my dad was left orphaned in desperately poor Korea. But he always dreamed of coming to the United States. He felt like that was his golden ticket to escape out of poverty. And when I think about my dad's story, I think about the millions of children around the world who are displaced, who experience war and conflict and persecution, and really oftentimes have nowhere to go for safety. Um, right now, we are facing an unprecedented refugee crisis in which 80 million people are forcibly displaced from their homes. This is a higher number than the numbers of displaced right after World War II. Um, and what that means is that there is a responsibility for us as a global community um, to not just care for these refugees, but to take leadership, especially for those in the church, of responding to the needs of our refugee neighbors um, and doing everything we can, we can to provide protection for them. Now, the United States has actually traditionally played a leadership role in providing refuge to those fleeing persecution in two ways. One, through the Refugee Settlement Program, in which the State Department partners with agencies like World Relief to resettle refugees that cannot go back home or locally integrate. But the other way is by allowing those who are fleeing violence and persecution to enter into the United States by crossing a border and staking their claim for asylum in the United States. Tragically, over the past few years, uh, the opportunities to seek asylum in the United States and to seek refuge through the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program has significantly diminished. Uh, the U.S. used to traditionally resettle on average 95,000 refugees per year, um, or I should say that was a refugee ceiling that was set by their president over the past many years. Um, but this year, we actually saw the lowest refugee ceiling ever set, set in the history of the United States at 18,000 even though we're seeing the world's worst displacement crisis since World War II. Also, at the border, what we've been seeing is a separation of children from their families. Uh, with the border effectively closed because of COVID-19, it's also meant that many asylum seekers who are trying to access protection of the United States are not able to come in and are actually living in migrant camps on the border between the United States and Mexico, which has oftentimes been a very dangerous situation for many of them. This should be really concerning for many of us in the church because our values of hospitality and of love and wanting to protect the stranger is, um, is being uh, significantly stretched. And at a time when we should be doing as much as we can um, through the asylum and the refugee programs to provide protection to those fleeing persecution, we are doing a very, um, uh, we could be doing better and we can be doing, uh, we can allow our, our systems to actually be working uh, for the greater good. I think for many of us in the church as well, what we're seeing around the world is that the church is at the front lines of responding to the refugee crisis. Uh, many Jordanian churches are responding by hosting I mean, housing Syrian refugees right in their own church buildings. We know churches in Germany are reaching out to their refugee neighbors. We know churches in Kenya and Uganda are also uh, housing and, and feeding and sheltering uh, those who are fleeing persecution and entering into their communities. And so the global church is actually leading the U.S. church in responding to those who are entering into our communities to provide basic assistance, to provide hospitality to those who are fleeing persecution. What we know in scriptures is that God commands us to show hospitality to the stranger. In fact, in Matthew 25, Jesus says, when I was a stranger, you welcomed me. And in Hebrews 13, it says, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, you may be entertaining angels without knowing it. 
Now that word for entertaining strangers is philoxenia or philo love xenia, the stranger. So philoxenia is a love of a stranger. The opposite of philoxenia is xenophobia, is a fear of the stranger. And oftentimes in the United States, we have encountered xenophobia, people who are fearful of others who are coming from different countries. But what we know about scripture is that our uh, positioning as, a, as Christians should be the opposite of xenophobia. It should be a philoxenia or a love for the stranger because by entering into relationships with those that are immigrants and those that are refugees, uh, we can experience the blessing of God through those relationships. Um, we are in an election season right now in which we are putting our values to the test, in which we are choosing which elected official is going to best represent our values um, as they take their positions of power. Um, and I wanna say uh, affirm affirmatively that there can be Christians in the Democratic Party, there can be Christians in the Republican Party, it's important to remember that the way that we vote does not define our faith, but in fact, it's the opposite. Our faith should define the way that we vote and that we should actually keep our elected officials accountable for reflecting the values that we hold dear as Christians and how they implement systems and policies that actually impact some of our most vulnerable neighbors. It's important to remember that when we talk about caring for our neighbors, especially for those who are extremely vulnerable, we care for our neighbors through inter inter interpersonal relationships and through interactions with them, but we also care for them by speaking into and building systems and structures in which our neighbors can actually flourish. Engaging in politics is not a question of if we should, it's a question of how we should. And by how, I believe God calls us to charity, to respect, to mutuality, and to honesty in the ways that we engage in our political conversation. The United States has always been engaged in a heated debate about how many people we should let in and whom we should let in. But what's been undeniable is the United States' strong tradition in offering refuge to those who are fleeing persecution, and that tradition should not stop now. Uh, as we vote uh, in the election, and as we always think about our political engagement in the future, I think it's important not just for us to prioritize certain issues as we do so, but to also remember that even as we prioritize issues, we should hold whatever elected official we're voting for um, accountable for the way that they are implementing certain policies. And so I think it's fully appropriate for us to support certain elected officials knowing that they're not perfect, but when they are in office to also remember to put the pressure on them, to be in conversation with them, and to really be stewards of our voice to influence the, poli the political realms for the good of our neighbor. I think at a time when people can often debate the merits of immigration and oftentimes immigrants um, uh, are talked about in a very negative way, what we know is that Christ calls us to be in community with our immigrant neighbors. And not only that, for many of us who live in this vibrant democracy, it's an obligation for us to be able to instill our values of hospitality and compassion in the way that our country implements its immigration laws as well. Uh, there will continue to be opportunities for us to engage in these conversations, both with our friends and our family and with ele elected officials. And I think it's critically important that as we do so, we speak up with our values and our principles that oftentimes can tr transcend politics. Martin Luther King Jr. reminds us that the church should not be the master of the state or the servant of the state, but the conscious of the state. We have a responsibility to continue to speak up to continue to use our voice and to do so in communion with others uh, so that we can pursue justice for the flourishing of all of our neighbors and for the good of all. It is my hope that in this time of unprecedented displacement, that the church would not only be on the front lines of caring for our immigrant neighbors and our refugee neighbors, um, but that we would also be at the forefront of political conversations um, in which we can affirm the dignity of those who are displaced and humanize the story so that our elected officials can implement policies that will really lead to the flourishing of all. So that is my hope, and I hope you'll join me in continuing the conversation in our communities and across the country as well.